Taking it sweet time today. There we go. Okay, so welcome to unit three, lesson one, where we look at the basics of DNA. A large majority of this should be reviewed from grade 11 for you. So I won't spend too, too much time talking about the specific details uh, that pertain to the concepts that you've already learned. I wanna instead focus on the new concepts that build off of those ideas and kind of tie in that aspects of the biochemistry learned in unit one as well as that uh, metabolic processes and the things that we learned from unit two and, and how it pertains to DNA as a whole and why it's so crucial that we understand this concept in the context of everything we've learned so far. So if you can recall, DNA is the, uh, the function of DNA and where it is located. It is in the nucleus and it provides the instructions for cellular processes. And the interesting component about this is that now that we know how some of those processes start to work, we can start to tie in the understanding of how DNA kind of directs the show, so to speak. So DNA is arranged in chromosomes, right? And typical human somatic cell has 20 or 46 uh, chromosomes, the gametes containing 23 per chromosome, so two sets of 23. And we, we notice that this is necessary because when they combine, you wanna add those gametes together. When a new offspring is formed, uh, the mother and the father's DNA are going to combine to form that 46 chromosomes to give all that genetic information to that offspring, half from each parent. That way we can ensure that genetic diversity. So when we think about proteins and when we think about amino acids and what the, those proteins are made out of and how they're arranged in different quantities and sequences, we can really start to appreciate that those proteins have an incredibly important function in the cell. And we've looked at some of those proteins already. Enzymes, they really kind of help drive the show with regards to reactions in the cell. So when we think about the sequence of amino acids, it's going to help dictate the structure as well as that function. So how do, we, how do cells know how to build proteins? They get that instruction from DNA. Those DNA give instructions to the cell and they tell the cells how to build proteins. So in this unit, we're gonna look at the direct translation and transformation of DNA information into protein information, which the cell will then utilize to do multitudes of processes. So we're really looking at the underpinning concept of life itself as a result of the ability for DNA to store instructions and then give those instructions out, which for me, it's, it's maybe one of the most beautiful concepts of biology, that, that movement from DNA storage to uh, the things that we are as a species, as a people, organisms, what have you. It's, it's, it's beautiful. So the human genome contains approximately 25,000 genes and more than 3 billion base pairs, right? We're just talking about the human genome as a whole here. 25,000 genes, 3 billion base pairs. So when a particular protein is needed, the cell will activate those genes that will code for the protein. We're gonna look at this process in, uh, in detail later on through this unit, but each gene effectively codes for one specific protein. And, and that is kind of the important component of understanding that connections of, of genetics that you learned last year when you looked at how genes get passed on and, and those Punnett squares and understanding of how that works with regards to disorders, traits, what have you, and now we're gonna look at the actual biomolecular components of how those things are passed on. So when we have to, we have to look back at the structure of DNA in order to really truly understand and appreciate how all of that is going to work. So when we look at the structure of DNA and its, its composition of nucleotides, which contain those amino, which contain those amino acids specifically uh, th that we've kind of talked about, but more importantly, we also have to consider the, the several components that make up DNA as well, because it really helps us to determine how things are structured. Uh, so it contains that phosphate backbone, as well as that deoxyribose sugar that comprise to make that backbone. And then we have that nitrogenous base, that part three, that's gonna really help with our understanding. So there's two uh, groups of nitrogenous bases, four in total. So we have purines, which are double ringed, the adenine and that guanine are those double ring structures. 
And then we have the purines, which are going to be single ring structures, and that's going to be our thymine and our cytosine. So it's important to recognize that those nucleo, uh, nucleotides are going to be bound together with what's called a phosphodiester bond. All right, those phosphodiester bonds are going to look at utilizing that phosphate group to kind of form that connection. So that phosphate group of one nucleotide and the deoxyribose sugar of the next nucleotide can be connected to each other through a dehydration or that condensation reaction. So this is where our starting to connect those ideas that we learned in unit one with regards to dehydration and then later hydrolysis. We're gonna look at utilizing those reactions to break apart and form DNA effectively. So that phosphate group on the five end of that ribose sugar, that deoxyribose sugar, it's removed. And then it's removed utilizing that formation of water, that dehydration process. And it happens as a result of that phosphate group reacting with that, um, that hydroxyl group on that deoxyribose. It removes that water. And now we have a connected nucleotide chain. So we can continue that process, that phosphate group gets connected via a hydrolysis reaction, or sorry, a condensation reaction to that hydroxyl group, and you can continue that stacking of nucleotides on. So we have that phosphodiester bond that links nucleotides together. And again, that's something that we've kind of looked at consistently throughout this class, specifically in unit one and a little bit in unit two, the idea that we can remove water, we can remove water from a hydroxyl group and hydrogen ion specifically, and we can look at that connection of things using that dehydration. So to truly understand and appreciate the importance of DNA and how it pertains to how we can utilize and understand its ability to, to store and to share and translate that information to proteins, we have to understand the double-stranded nature of DNA. And it's that double-stranded nature of DNA that are held together by those hydrogen bonds between complementary nitrogenous bases that really form that structure for DNA. These strands are considered to be anti-parallel, okay? Anti-parallel, but par parallel but in opposite directions or opposite orientations. So what I mean by that is when you take a look at the five prime end, which I'll call it as by the leading carbon in that uh, ribo, deoxyribose sugar, the five prime end is going to coincide with the three prime end on that other strand. And then likewise, the three prime end of one strand will coincide with or match up with that five prime end of the other strand. All, and then we're talking about in terms of the sugar phosphate backbone with regards to how we're looking at that five prime and three prime end. So to understand that complementary base component, again, we really have to recognize that bases will always pair the same way, that uh, C and G will form those hydrogen bonds with each other, and the A and T will form hydrogen bonds with each other. It won't really work any other way, right? And they're forming those hydrogen bonds, as I alluded to earlier. And again, that anti-parallel orientation, the strands run in opposite directions, opposite directions, that five prime and three, five prime to three prime in one area and three prime to five prime in the other. So it coincides with those strands. So how does DNA orient itself and how does it organize itself? Those are the two things that we need to consider when we move forward through this unit. So why does DNA need to be organized in chromosomes? Well, they're too long, right? They're too long. As you learned last year, one strand of DNA can stretch miles upon miles upon miles upon miles. So cells need to be able to access those genes when they are basically, when they're, not, when they're not needing to access those genes, they need to be stored in a way that is space efficient. So when they're not accessing it, they're coiled up. And, the, and that's the most important thing is that it stores it and packs it away in a tiny little package that is the chromosome. So the width of the DNA strand is always going to be two nanometers due to that complementary base pairing. And it's, again, important to recognize that as it unravels, you can have access to it to uh, copy it, to read it, to make it into proteins, what have you. So DNA is wrapped around proteins that are called histones. 
And those histones form as the backbone structure of that chromosome, and they coil them together to form those things called nucleosomes. Several nucleosomes bundle into coils, and they form thicker strands called chromatin. Chromatin then condense into chromosomes. So the last thing I want you to recall with regards to this unit, or with regards to this lesson, sorry, is that DNA would be found in the form of chromatin during interphase, interphase meaning that G1, S, or G2 phases. And then chromosomes will be found during cellular division, mitosis, and meiosis. Okay, that is the end of the lesson one for today. Uh, I'm gonna take a bit of time to let you digest some of this information and in about 30 minutes, I'm going to come back and I'll do lesson two this morning. So if you want to take a look at the homework section 1.5 in unit three folder, questions on page 47, eight to 12, take a look at some of those to kind of really hammer home the points with regards to the information that I've shared with you. And then we'll come back in about 30 or so minutes and I'll do lesson two.